First developed by Lockheed Martin, the cybersecurity kill chain is a model for describing the steps an attacker must complete to carry out a successful attack. The model is made up of seven sequential steps, including reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control, and finally, actions on objectives. To disrupt the attack, one or more of these steps must be broken for the entire chain to fail. And in order for us to do that, we need to understand their playbook. Using the NIST cybersecurity framework as a reference, we'll look at tools at every phase that will lead to a multi-layered security plan for our organization. I'm Andy with the CISO Perspective, and this video is called Breaking the Kill Chain, a defensive approach. Reconnaissance. The first step of any cybersecurity attack is to gather information about the victim, also known as reconnaissance. The two different stages of reconnaissance are passive and active. During the passive reconnaissance stage, an attacker will use indirect methods to gather information from publicly available sources like Whois, errand registrations, Google, Shodan, job listings, and company websites. Once an attacker has collected as much public information as possible, they'll move on to active reconnaissance. This involves some level of interaction with your organization. During this phase, the attacker will actively probe your network or system looking for open ports and services. This includes technical tools like Nmap for port scanning and banner grabbing and vulnerability scanners. Now, vulnerability scanners are very loud and obvious, so attackers will usually limit their scope or slow scan over a period of time to avoid being caught. Defending against passive reconnaissance means limiting the level of detail we expose publicly. That means limiting the information we put on job postings, training personnel on acceptable use of social media sites, and removing specific error messages from public servers. Our first protective measure is to ensure that unused ports and services are disabled. This limits the number of entry points an attacker can use to get into your system. Honeypots are a great tool that can be used as a decoy against a would-be attacker. Not only do they divert attention away from real systems, but it also reveals what they're after and who they are. A firewall with IPS capabilities on the perimeter will provide filtering and segmentation while also monitoring for port scans and banner grabs. Most next generation firewalls can block connections from Tor networks and known proxy IP addresses, which are commonly used during this phase to obfuscate the real IP from an attacker. The entire goal of the reconnaissance phase is to find a weakness that can be exploited. Once the attacker has found that weakness, they can move on to the next step. Weaponization. Once an attacker has found a weakness, their next step is to find or create an attack that will exploit that vulnerability. The weapon of choice will depend on the information they collected from you during the reconnaissance step. Some commonly used weapons during this phase are tools like Metasploit or ExploitDB. These are repositories for known exploits. The Veal framework, which is commonly used to generate evasion code for malware. Social engineering toolkit, if they decided that they will deliver the malware through a social engineering campaign. And of course, many others. Since this stage is all about what the attacker uses as a weapon, we need to have some of the basics covered, and that includes things like patch management. Patch management continues to be one of the best defensive measures against the weaponization stage, because you can't exploit a vulnerability if there's no vulnerability to exploit. The vast majority of today's breaches are still due to unpatched servers. Office macros, JavaScript, browser plugins are all common avenues for an attacker to exploit, so disabling these alone will greatly reduce your exposure as well. Some technical controls we can apply at this stage are things like antivirus on the endpoint and perimeter to protect against known malware, an IPS that's specifically tuned to look for exploit attempts, not just port scanning and banner grabbing like in the reconnaissance stage, and email security that includes antivirus and anti-spam. In later stages, we'll look at specific email security features that we can enable. During this phase, the attacker is selecting which tool to use, but they haven't actually delivered it yet. How they deliver the attack is as critical as what they choose for a weapon. And that brings us to the third stage, delivery. By this point, the attacker has selected the weapon based on their earlier reconnaissance. Now the delivery stage is where they try one or multiple avenues to deliver the weapon. The delivery of the attack varies by the kind of attack, but some common examples can include things like websites, malicious or clean. An attacker can infect a legitimate website they know your users frequent, social media, user input. This means the attacker has some level of interaction with a public server like a website or a database, email, if the attacker has found the partner your company uses during the reconnaissance phase, they can embed malware into an order form that your employees are more likely to open if they fish the email to make it look like it's coming from a partner. USB. Common attacks are to leave infected USBs in public areas and around employees' cars, hoping the temptation for them to put it into their laptop is too much. The single best security measure against the delivery of the attack is user awareness. This includes security training and phishing campaigns that teaches personnel the basics of good security practices. While all the protective measures we discussed in the weaponization stage still apply, there's a few extra measures you can take to limit the delivery channels an attacker can use. Email security, but specifically DKIM and SPF. 
Dkim and SPF are email authentication methods to detect spoofed emails. SPF makes sure that emails are coming from an authorized IP of the domain, while Dkim uses digital signatures to verify authenticity. Both techniques help ensure that emails are coming from legitimate authorized channels. Web filtering can prevent a user from accessing questionable or known bad websites. Disabling USBs and not giving users admin rights also prevents a big portion of delivery mechanisms that malwares typically use. DNS filtering. While websites block web requests destined to malicious sites, using a DNS security solution can block any DNS lookup attempt to prevent communications over any protocol. I always use this in combination with web filtering. Remember, SSL accounts for the majority of web and email traffic you see today, so if you're not doing SSL inspection in all of your delivery channels, you may be completely blind to what's passing through that encrypted tunnel. Exploitation. During the exploitation stage, the attacker has effectively delivered the weapon of choice to the victim and the attack has been executed. This means we have failed to keep the weapon out of our environment and the only thing left for the attacker to do is pull the trigger. The actual exploit could come in the form of a buffer overflow, a SQL injection, malware that was undetected by our antivirus solution, a client-side exploit that was executed on an older version of JavaScript, and of course many others. Protective measures are limited once an attacker has been able to execute the exploit, but some do exist. DEP, or Data Execution Prevention, is a software and hardware feature which attempts to prevent execution of code in memory where it doesn't belong. Anti-exploit is a feature on some antivirus solutions and monitor known applications for unusual calls to memory. Both of these techniques act as a last line of defense against common exploit attempts. The reality is when an attacker gets to this point, you're relying on post-infection tools like a sandbox to detect exploits that have already been executed. A sandbox has some preventive capabilities depending on the scenario, but for most network environments, you have what's called patient zero. Patient zero refers to the first time an unknown file is seen on the network. The first person to download the file would be infected because the malware analysis can take several minutes to complete. However, once the sandbox determines that the file is malicious, it can then block that file and protect all your other users. It will alert you that the patient zero is infected and you can move on towards remediation and recovery steps. It's worth noting that an exploit takes advantage of some weakness in an application or operating system, but it's not the finish line for the attack. The goal of the exploit is to gain better access, and that leads us to our next step. Installation. The exploitation and the installation phase go hand in hand. A successful exploit allows me to inject a payload that will give me a better level of access to accomplish my mission. From an attacker's perspective, gaining better access allows me to control the victim at any point in the future, even after a system has been patched or rebooted. Some common payload and techniques during this stage involve DLL hijacking, injecting Meterpreter or similar payloads, installing a remote access tool, otherwise known as RAT, registry changes to make a program automatically start up or persistent, and executing PowerShell in fileless attacks. Once an attacker has gotten this far into the system, very limited protective tools exist. Linux-based systems can use chroot jail as a way to isolate processes from the rest of the system, and in this way limiting the amount of data the malicious file has access to. Windows-based systems can disable PowerShell altogether on systems that don't require it. Fortunately, we have really good post-infection tools we can use at this stage that monitor system files and registry for unusual activities. A good UBA or EDR solution should flag any new unauthorized program that has been installed, as well as detect any changes to registry and system processes. The unauthorized changes to system processes and registries should cause a log and alert to go off. And way before you get to this stage, your team should already have an SOP or plan for this type of event. This includes things like identifying if the device is mission critical, removing the device from the network, changing all credentials for users that were logged in, and so on. Once a system is determined to be infective, you can then begin the process of restoring that system to a known good state. Command and Control At this stage, the system has been completely compromised and in control of the attacker. If they completed the previous steps correctly, their access is persistent, even if you reboot or patch a vulnerability. The infected device could immediately be used to carry out the mission, or it could sit back and wait for further instructions from its command and control server. Our defensive tactics are going to be around limiting what they can control and detecting unusual activity. Limiting the damage of a breach starts with segmentation. Segmentation will make it harder for the attacker to move laterally and easier to detect using audit logs. If you have the ability to do micro-segmentation through a zero-trust security model, even better. This would essentially leave the infected user completely isolated on a port until they can verify the machine is clean and have been authenticated. As for technical controls, most next-generation firewalls have a database of known command control servers. Enabling this feature will help block remote access from known bad actors. 
There are also many free and paid DNS servers that offer botnet and command control protection at the DNS level. Attackers will often use evasion techniques such as DBA or FastFlux to generate a large number of domains that are used as rendezvous. Blocking access to recently observed domains will stop connections to these common hops. While on the topic of next generation firewalls, make sure you're using layer 7 application control to block commonly known remote access tools like Telnet, SSH, Netcat, PowerShell, RDP, and various other protocols that really have no business leaving your network. If you do have a business case for using these tools, try to lock it down to specific IP addresses. An attacker will almost always use encrypted connections to avoid being caught. So if you're not doing full SSL deep packet inspection, you're completely blind to any communication attempts going through that tunnel. For detection, Indicators of compromise, or IOCs, are excellent post-detective tools as well. An IOC is an observed behavior by a user server that are indicative of a breach. IOCs can be observed and collected on the endpoint, or it could be collected by a SIM device with an IOC feed. Actions on objective. With the machine now infected and the attacker in full control, they can now execute the action to achieve their objective. The action is predicated by the motivation of the attacker, so understanding the type of attacker that could be targeting your organization is critical. Attackers could be motivated by financial reasons, political, nation state, malicious insiders, or simply wanting to move laterally to go after a more important system on the network. If the goal is data exfiltration, we can look into tools that prevent data from moving off of the endpoint or server. On endpoint, tools like DLP or UBA solutions have complementary features to detect and prevent specific files from moving off the network. The problem is, if an attacker has already gained access to your system, doing something as simple as a screenshot on a protected document would not be detected by most of these tools. Lateral movement is a common step for an attacker to take once they've gained access into a system, at which point they begin their reconnaissance stage all over again to gain information about the internal network. This is why network segmentation between different clearance levels is so important to a network design. The Zero Trust Security model is built around the idea that eventually we're all going to fall victim to this stage of the kill chain. By removing the idea of trust on your inside network, you can treat all users as untrusted until proven otherwise. While we won't go into detail of the Zero Trust Security model, this model is very effective at detecting infected machines and limiting the damage that can be done by the attacker. Once a compromised machine is identified, you can begin your incident response planning and eventually re-image the system before putting it back on your network. The CISO Perspective the kill chain is more than just a model for how an attack is executed. It's also a blueprint for building a good cybersecurity program. By using multiple layers of security throughout each phase, we make it more and more challenging for the attack to be successful. And that by itself may be a victory because so many attacks are just opportunistic in nature. The challenge I always give my clients is to rate their security posture from 1 to 10 at each phase of the chain. How would your organization deal with an attack who got all the way through to the installation phase? Do you have the processes in place that could detect that? If so, how long would the attacker sit in that phase before it's remediated? Minutes? Hours? Days? Dwell time is the length of time an attacker is active inside the network before being detected. For CISOs and security directors, this is a critical metric to follow. According to a report by the Panama Institute and IBM, the average dwell time is 191 days. I'll end the video on that scary statistic and I hope you found all of this informative. Please comment, hit like, subscribe to stay on top of all of our latest releases here at the CISO Perspective.